welcome. Tonight, we have a very important contributor to our neighborhoods that nobody seems to know who they are or what they actually do. Um, we've had somebody come all the way up from Fall Reeve to uh, talk to us. I guess it's Fall Reeve. Dartmouth. Would be Dartmouth. A is Dartmouth? Where we're located, yeah. I mean, we always think of Bristol County. I mean, being Portuguese, it's, you know, it's New Beige, Fall Reeve, it's that right. area. That whole area. But why don't we start with an introduction? Well, yeah, I, I'm Sheriff Tom Hodgson. I'm the sheriff of Bristol County, Massachusetts. And uh, I, um, <clears throat> I came here uh, from Maryland originally, but I started my career in law enforcement uh, down in Maryland as a police officer. And uh, eventually worked my way up here and over the course of time became, was elected sheriff in 1997. I was appointed in 97, elected for my first term in 98, and been serving as the sheriff since that time. And of course, uh, we talked off the air earlier about the idea that a lot of people don't really understand what does a sheriff do, how did sheriffs evolve? We're, we're, uh, we, actually, we actually invented law enforcement, believe it or not, going back to the, the earliest days of uh, English tradition. And, um, and uh, the sheriff was the sort of collector of the taxes for the king back when, and they, they were, back then, instead of counties, they were called shires, and that's where the term, it was sharif, and eventually oh. became sheriff. So, uh, and of course, evolved into the United States. We were the first law enforcement officers in, in, the, in the country, and uh, over time, then there became municipal police departments that developed, and so, uh, depending where you are in the country, would depend on how involved or what the role of the sheriff is. But we are um, constitutionally established as, appoint as opposed to police officers who are appointed uh, by municipalities. So uh, we're elected by the people and we serve in Massachusetts. We have six term, six year terms. And um, our, ro our responsibilities in Massachusetts are to continue with our law enforcement support of our local police departments. We have collaborations and task forces and things we work with uh, local police on, as well as running uh, primarily, uh, operating the prison and the jail uh, in each county. So uh, we're, we're sort of a still continuing in our law enforcement role, but we're also responsible for the correction side of it in doing um, you know, the operations of the prisons, administering the prisons and things like that. Uh, as well as we have civil process division that does civil process work, serving papers for, for attorneys and courts and so forth. Um, in other parts of the country, some sheriffs, for example, LA County, the sheriffs basically do the patrol that you would normally see law enforcement. So I was going to say, w when we were in Gaithersburg, yep. uh, Montgomery County seemed to run law enforcement. Yeah, they had county police force. Right. As opposed, but Rockville City which is in Montgomery County, also had their own city police force. Oh, I never knew that. Yes. So there were some communities that still wanted to have their own local police, but the county police department would patrol the entire county. And so, um, you know, it, it depends where you are in the country as to how it evolves. But the one thing about the office of sheriff is that we have always retained the power as the number one law enforcement officer in the, in the respective counties in the country. That's, that's by constitution. So that really is sort of the, the fundamental role we have. And that can see, I can see advantages both ways because Tom, one of the things I like about Milford, the way we have the police set up, they get no benefit from writing tickets except safety. Right. So we're not gonna turn around to our police chief and say, okay, Mike, you better write 500 tickets or you don't have a budget for your last police officer. Right. So like whether you write one or a thousand, that thousand tickets revenue goes into the general fund. And okay. you don't, I guess you see it, you know, from the fact that the town budget benefits. Right. But, it, but I would tell you, most police departments, uh, they aren't driven by the money. They are, as you said, which is important, they're driven by making sure that people follow the rules, don't put other people at risk, um, and, and cause people harm or even death. And that's why they have tickets, is because more often than not, that when officers can give a warning, they will. Uh, but they, they also recognize that if there's some egregious offense, 
there is a consequence for it that people have to pay, pay for the, uh, the fine. I'd say 99% of the time I'd believe you. I came out of Logan Airport once at 12.30 at night, and I got pulled over. And the officer just came out and said, do you know how fast you were doing? I said, it had to be under 60 because I'm in third gear, because you're doing 59. So I, I said, I don't want to be flippant, sir, but is that a problem? He says, you know what the speed limit is? I said, 65 on the mass bike. He says, not in the tunnels. It's 45. Oh. So 99% of the time, I'll agree with you, but me doing 59 on the mass bike didn't seem egregious. Well, of course, uh, but... But it's something you never forgot. Well, I'll tell you, he had his effect. I don't even know what the ticket cost, but I'll give him credit. I'll, I downshift every time I hit that tunnel to make sure. Of course, of course. And, and I would tell you that, um, I, similarly, when I, when I was a cop, I, I would go out, you know, I, if I had a kid that was flying up the highway, I'd pull them over. And, and it happened uh, on one particular occasion where the kid was really moving along and it was six o'clock, seven o'clock at night. And still light out, but I pulled him over. I didn't give him a ticket. He was 17 or 18. But he stayed there for about 15 or 20 minutes because he had told me he was on his way to his girlfriend's house. And he was in a hurry. He was running late. He was supposed to have dinner with the, the girlfriend and the family. And I said, but you know what? If I didn't stop you, you may never have gotten there. Right. And I, I, I lectured him more than he probably wanted to be lectured and probably made him later than he wanted to be and probably ended up with more regrets that way than he would have been a ticket. But he would remember. But he also remember he didn't get a ticket. Right. Now, you say the sheriff takes care of the jails and the prisons. We administer the jails and the prisons, yeah. We have probably the most complex job of any state job in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We are dealing with the most difficult people, particularly with the, the uh, evolution of the opioid crisis, the drug problem in this country, uh, the mental health problems. They shut all the mental health hospitals and basically are, are sending them to our places where we have strict schedules, we have to, around when people move, classification around the level of disciplines, the threats to one inmate or another, uh, to our officers, depending on how people are classified, and when you move them, how you serve their meals. Everything has to be on a very strict schedule. You've got, um, you know, the, the health issues. We, we detox, in Bristol County, we detox more than any other sheriff's office in the entire state and including MASAC, uh, Massachusetts Alcohol uh, Center. Um, we average on a daily seven detoxes a day, a day in Bristol County. We have uh, serious drug problems. We have to deal with the mental health issues around potentials for suicide. We have to create all kinds of new um, stopgap measures to deal with a, a, a more crisis population coming in. We have to manage, when you think about the number of people we have to manage from our, our our employees. In Bristol County, we have s about 650 employees. I mean, in our district attorney's office there, they have 165. Um, our budget is 47 million. The district attorney's budget is 10. Ours is four times. So when you start thinking about managing the taxpayer's money alone to run that operation, maintenance, think of the maintenance issues, the health care issues, the, the staffing, the overtime, the recruitment, all of these things, the policies, the many, many policies, procedures, the inspections we go through. Um, you have, you, we've had 23 inspections in 24 months, federal, state, and local, DPH, comptroller, I mean the, uh, excuse me, the auditor's office. All these things, and we are, we are scrutinized more than any other agency in the Commonwealth. Now, please take this the way I mean it, not sure. the way it sounds. Sure. Are your people up to this? I mean. You take somebody who's a career law enforcement officer or whatever you call a corrections officer, and all of a sudden you say, you're not only dealing with people who've done bad things, but now I'm going to throw at you people who don't know better, you know, mentally handicapped. Correct. Correct. How do you make, and I don't mean it in a negative way, but my God, if I spent my whole life training on this, yeah, and now from what you're saying, a large percentage of what I'm doing is that. Yeah. It's, uh, look, w w we, de we deal with the, with the populations that come in. It's our obligation. Our job is to do everything we can. And I tell my, my recruits this. There's no rewarding, more rewarding job that you could possibly have than to be in corrections. It takes a special kind of person 
to deal with these different attitudes, gangs, all the things we have in there that you have to constantly pay attention to. Um, but you can take somebody every day to a better place in life because these people, many of them didn't come from good places in life. Mm. You know, didn't have a shot at three or four years old when they're sitting on a stoop in a diaper and a t-shirt in November while their parents are pushing drugs up and down in their stroller, right? What chance does that kid have? Here they are now in adulthood. Nobody taught them how far to push on the edge of the bubble. So you're going to be, as an officer, your job isn't just to watch people. We have razor wire and fencing. We got locked doors to keep people in places they belong. So I don't really need you to do that. I need you to interact with these people and channel them toward programs that are going to help them deal with their substance abuse issue, get their GED. Uh, we have one of the highest GED uh, graduation rates in the state. We have college programs that where college students come in from UMass Dartmouth and do their class at our place with inmates. Um, so, so it's all about focusing on transitioning these people to, to reintegrate into society and not continue on a life of crime and get into a trajectory where they're going to be successful. Because as I tell our recruits and all our staff, that's our charge. There is nothing that could impact public safety more effect, more, more importantly than any other organization. Cops deal with you for a short period of time. We now have them, in, no pun intended, a captured environment to be able to channel them at least to walk out with at least one new tool in their toolbox they didn't have. And there's nothing we could do better for public safety than to have a less chance of them going out and victimizing people and to have them see things differently in regards to their, their, uh, their pathway in life. So, so that really is, is our charge. Are our people up to it? Yes, they are, when they're trained properly. In my office, I started out early on, in, um, 22 years ago, just about shortly after I took over, to build in this whole accountability system. We measure every day on every shift 250 operating indicators from how many meals are served to overtime, how many maintenance slips were done during that day, how many are outstanding, um, fights inmate on inmate, gang issues. These are all categorized by, by category, 250 operating indicators. And so I can tell, my managers are able to tell in real time is why I did it. We're managing taxpayers' money. And we need to be able to account for it and know that it's being used wisely. If I ask you, why is your overtime in October running 10, or yeah, in October running 10% ahead of your projections? Are you aware of it, number one? Number two, what are you doing about it? You, sh you should have an answer. You should know. Because you can see it in real time. Whereas prior to that, you would nobody guess cared. It was like, hey, it's taxpayers' money. I'll just ask for more money, whatever, if we don't have enough. And that's how kind of things went. And I didn't come from that world. I came from a, a business background. So for me, if I was going to manage the operation and manage the taxpayer's money, I needed to be able to be accountable for it, and so did my people. And so, so that's why we're capable and able to handle these things. It isn't always easy. New changes come in. Legislators come in with these new new ideas about letting people get out 180 days out of a, a special management unit where they're violent and could hurt somebody. They, they, they're passing this law that you now have to, if they have 180 days less left on their sentence, you have to let them come out of their cell and go to programs. The problem is you're going to put them in a group and what, a seat with a cage around it? How much do you think the person's going to learn being the one person sitting in a, in a, in a chair with a cage around it? before they re-enter back into society. That's not the way you handle it. That isn't going to, and you have to put them in a chair with that because the person's that violent, but their rule says you got to put them out there and let them start getting used to reintegrating in the prison setting with other people. That isn't how you do it. But I mean, I'm getting used to being in a cage around. Well, basically, yeah, you take them out of the cell and you put them in a chair that has to have this protective cage so he doesn't hurt anybody in the group. It makes no sense. But this is the kind of thing that we have to adapt to and adjust to, even though these aren't people who are in the business and understand it. They don't come in our place and look at it. They don't ask us. We know what we're doing. We just need to make sure that we can constantly get the tools to do the job and, um, and not have people come in. This well, that's why I asked the question. It's not a, a slam against the officer, but when I say are they up to it, I mean, can you get enough money for training? Can you get enough money for programs? And can you not get interfered with? Well, <laughs> it's an interesting point. Um, the answer is we, we have to make do and we have to make sure we get training. We need 
more space for the detoxing and mental health things. Uh, we need uh, our officers don't get paid the same as the state correctional officers and they do the bulk of the work. We do all the six part folders uh, that have their whole history in it. When they get brought to our place, if they're gonna be sent to the state to do a state sentence, they're with us until such time as they get, they could be with us two years, three years on a murder charge and then get sentenced to go to the state. When they go to the state, we've already indoctrinated them institution, into an institutionalized setting. We've dealt with all their medical things. We've dealt with all those things. The discipline, keeping them under control, doing all those things, integrating them, and then they go to the state, they're already pretty well institutionalized. So what happens is our officers don't get what state correction officers get. We're fighting right now to get that for parity, and I've been fighting for it for, for, since 2007. So you're under a different, the county role is paid a different rate than the state role? Well, we are now really under the state when it comes to the financial aspects. We're still independently elected, but we fall under the state, under, under legislation that Deval Patrick put in. But, but, but the point is that our officers is, aren't getting paid the same as the state well, correctional officers. That's what I'm saying. And the state correctional officers agree with it. They say they should be paid. And this has gone on for years. So we have a bill filed right now a uh, parity bill that we would expect that the legislature will put through, you know, equal pay for equal work, and these guys do actually a little Now, work. a lot of us don't really understand. If I do something bad, our local police chief rounds me up, fingerprints me, does all that good stuff, and I could go into a cell in the Milford Police Station. What happens after that? Does he transfer me to you while I'm waiting for court, or it how depends. do I go from cell to jail to prison? Well, it depends on the county. I, when I took over, I opened up the first regional lockup in the state. I have the largest regional lockup in the state. So basically what will happen is any of the police departments in my county, if they arrest somebody, they can bring them to my Ash Street facility in New Bedford, drop them off, we take care of them, which makes all the sense in the world. You eliminate the liability for the taxpayer having the person stay at a police station lockup where the police officers aren't trained and updated on corrections practices. You know, you wouldn't expect an officer to know about positional asphyxiation, which is how somebody, if they're, if they're intoxicated or under the influence of drugs, how they're positioned in their cell, if they're not positioned properly and you weren't trained, they could die of asphyxiation because they're not, pro they're, they're, they're drunk or- I mean, even things like Narcan, well, the new regs for producing, as Narcan becomes generic, it used to be you just tested it straight up. Yep. And its effectiveness when delivered that way. But then the police officer is saying, hey guys, we don't hold people vertical. Most of the people that we have to administer Narcan to on the ground. are on the ground, Correct. either straight out 180 degrees sure. or you know, 45 degrees negative. So at least somebody listened because they're putting in new re uh, requirements. Right. But, but, but think about this. If, why would you expose a police officer and his family to a lawsuit of somebody that died in a cell when the officer did everything, but wasn't trained? Yeah, he did person, everything he, he was he, taught he, to. He did everything he was taught to do, but wasn't given the updates and things that were needed. It's not the ideal place to be holding somebody over a weekend. We have medical staff around the clock. We have food services. What I do yeah. in my county, they pay for, per inmate. They drop them to us. We take care of them. We take them to court. The police department doesn't have to take them to court. Take, and the adva other advantages, you let the police officers do what they do best, get back in the community and, and, I was gonna and say, prevent to me, crime. Not taking a police officer offline right. for how many hours? Correct. And keeping them away from being exposed to the person they arrested for as much time as you possibly can. You don't want to around, if it particularly if it was a difficult arrest, you don't want an officer to be exposed to that person for a long time. It, it makes all the sense in the world. You drop them off, leave them with the people that are trained in this business, eliminate the exposure of liability for that officer and for the taxpayer for a lawsuit because you know they're in a place where we do care in custody and we know it inside out. Makes all the sense in the world. But you raise a, the point since you brought it up about Narcan. This is an increasingly dangerous problem that makes, us, makes it more difficult for us to recruit in the community both for police and for, for the prisons. And that is the exposure when people come in off the street. So we had a situation about a year ago where one of our, in our regional lockup, 
inmate was brought in. Inmate was, female was lying on her bunk. So I think it was a weekend. And um, an officer, one of our officers was walking down, checking, doing his rounds. And he saw the girl was lying on her stomach and she had her hands underneath her. And it looked like she was hiding something. So he unlocked the cell door, said, get up, put your hands out. Put her hands out. She didn't have anything. So he thought, okay, there's something on the, he went over and he pulled the, the blanket. And when he did, he got hit with drugs. He got hit with, um, yeah, and he, he um, uh, with uh, fentanyl. And he, oh my God. within 10 minutes, he started slurring his speech. He was disoriented. We had to, we had to call the medics and they had the Narcan, my officer, three times. So now, of course, we have to look at more higher grade gloves. Cert, you know, as, as you probably know, and I'm sure the viewers probably know, you could take a penny and put a little dot of fentanyl on there, car fentanyl, not fentanyl, but car fentanyl. And that little dot, if it touches you, well, or you adjust it, will kill you. Yep. That's how dangerous this stuff is. The fentanyl itself, uh, not car fentanyl, but the other, is a way to, they've enhanced the effects of this drug. And so, so it's very dangerous. The cops on the street that are doing their jobs, they're, 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 be, they're Narcanning people, and they, they, it might be on the person's clothes or whatever, they ingest it, now they got a problem. That's how dangerous it is out there for, for law enforcement and for, for our prison people, our staff. But in spite of it, they do it every day. They do their jobs, they go in there, they deal with, you know how difficult it must be for teachers in the classroom with kids that are out, out of order and you know, not well behaved. Imagine dealing with those same kids. Pound. Well, they, they, those same kids now in adulthood. Right. But you're not just you're not able to let them go home after school. You're dealing with them around the clock for maybe months, years, and they. Well, but physically, well, now you a, got a 250 pound mama duke. You know, a guy right. who, or a gal who just is not a nice person. Right. But it's not a 10 year old kid that you're not worried they can hurt you. Right. And the other complex thing about all this is. It, not, forgetting the drug, um, the impacts of the drug involvement and, and the mental health problem, they, they, you know, there are legitimately people in our prisons who suffer from schizophrenia, who, who are not, who, who are really not, not... I walk this way, they're nice, I come back, and it's right, a monster. Right, and, and not because they want to be. Yeah, they have a said, it's it's not, a mental health... It's not that problem. they're choosing. Right. And so, so, but you got to be able to try to figure that out. Our people aren't doctors. We have medical, everybody sees medical hat staff when they come in the door, mental health. Our officers were constantly, we're ta training them. If you're seeing behavioral patterns that are shifting, somebody that starts giving away their items may be an indication that they're thinking about committing suicide. You know, all these things that they have to be trained in. It's what they do. So, so um, it's, a, it's a complex job. It's a very difficult job, but we do it. Wow. See, I always admired the officers for the fact that they can look at somebody who's like hurt a child and still be objective. Right. I, I don't think I could. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, to me, I can forgive just about everything but somebody who would hurt a child. Right. Well, and, and it works that way in the prison, too. That's the, the other thing with the prisoners themselves. Some, you know, some prisoners know that somebody's in there that's hurt a child, and it becomes a very difficult uh, challenge. We have to yeah, be I very heard careful. somehow in the pecking, I mean, you see it on TV, in the pecking order that people who hurt children are the low of the low? Well, you have to be, you have to be careful because what's happening is they're getting into the, you know, we have to classify those people in protective custody because if they're more vulnerable to have somebody, you know, to yes, you know, attack them or whatever. I know it's the right the thing to do, right? But I understand. You know, women, you hurt a kid. You know, I. I guess I don't belong in that role because I don't know that I could look objectively. Yeah, and it's it, it it's not an easy thing, it, you know, for anybody. Uh, you know, it's it's a hard thing to think about that. I'm sure some defense attorneys have a hard time with that kind of thing, right? It, that they have to be you know, concerned about, um, you know, defending somebody who might have done that. It's got to be a difficult place to be. I, I'm not sure I could do that. Um, but in our business, it isn't our place to judge. Uh, we have to, we have to, 
you know, our charge is care and custody, maintaining good, you know, safe environment for us and for our, our inmates. And, um, and that's really the, the most important thing you can do inside of, a, inside of a prison. That's amazing. So now, again, if I go to the jail, you're going to take me in, you're going to process me, you're going to educate me the procedures. How long do I stay in jail? It depends. Now, if you're waiting trial, you could be there, depending on the number of pleas that you have by your attorney, you could be in there for up to anywhere from, from you know, two years. Uh, you could be there three years uh, waiting trial, depending on how many appeals there are and all of that. Uh, you could, you could be bailed out if you're if you're coming in and you have bail you could you could be bailed out depending on on the situation um, or you could be there just awaiting your trial for a month you could be there three now, days is the jail a temporary place the jail is where our pretrial okay that's for pretrial people who have not been sentenced yet and so um, in Bristol, we have the, actually the oldest operating jail in the country. It's been around since John Quincy Adams was president. And, uh, but I will tell you, it's one of the cleanest, quietest, safest jails you'll ever walk into. And, um, and that's where we hold about 210 uh, people who are, who are pretrials. Our population is about, it fluctuates, but it's about 50% pretrial, 50% sentenced. The, the number of pretrials have gone up. It used to be much different. Uh, where we had less pretrials, but but now once I'm sentenced, what determines if I stay with the jail or if I question. go to, to prison? Yeah, it, it, you will stay in the county system if you have a sentence of two and a half years or less. Now you could potentially uh, get a two and a half year sentence with some on and afters that have to do with some other other issue, but it, you generally on aren't there. On and after. Yeah, on and after meaning. Okay, so two and a half years you, you're going to do, but then you have an additional time you're doing off of another sentence. Oh, oh, so like multiple. So you might be there, you know, you could potentially be there for, you know, three years, four years, something like that, but not, not very often. But you're not going to get lifers or 10 to 20 year people. Or well, no, we get, we get everybody that is a lifer, but they're with us until they get the life sentence. So, okay. we get the, so we're dealing with the same vicious person. I was going to say, so if, until I'm a, such time. if I'm a murderer, rapist, pillager, at least until I'm sentenced. You're with us. You're dealing with we me. We see everybody. We, everybody that's arrested in our county, regardless of what the crime is, they will be with us. And more often than not, the murderers and so forth, they will be with us and, you know, because they often try to appeal and it's a much more serious crime, so they try to... Milk you know, it out? As best they can. To their view is it better for they want to stay in jail or do they want to go to prison well no county they they, they would pr prefer to be well let me just speak for bristol um that probably isn't a good example because we've been told by attorneys in our county uh that when somebody's facing a state sentence which is more than two and a half years and they tell them look i can plead if you plead to a lesser charge i can get you into bristol county and they tell them no way I'd rather do more time upstate than go to Bristol County. And the reason is, is because when I took over, I took the weights away and I donated them to Boys and Girls Club. I took the school boards off the gymnasium wall, the electric school boards are one of the be most beautiful gymnasiums in the state. The bleachers, you have parents sitting on the, on the floor at Fairhaven High School, uh, at the, the middle school, watching their kids play basketball and their kids didn't do anything wrong and you got beautiful bleachers inside a prison for what? in this beautiful gymnasium. So I donated those to the, the middle school, got rid of that, turned that gymnasium into a religious retreat center. And, um, and, I, uh, and I basically said, look, if you're gonna come here, we're not gonna provide you weights. I'm not gonna, because if we were in jail, you and I, and they said to us, hey, listen, you, got, you have an anger issue, I got a substance abuse issue. They said to us, okay, you can go to an anger management program, or you can lift weights, play cards, shoot hoops, and hang out. Same with me. Or you can go to that anger management program, right? Or I can go to that substance abuse program. You I ain't never going. Nor am I. And guess what? That's how it was. People used to like coming to, to our prison. They liked it because they could go there. They were, one guy said to me right after I took over, 
and I started changing things. And he'd been out. He was a businessman, he, but he got himself in trouble. But he was out now. And he had started paying attention to what I was doing when I first took over, making these changes. And he said, that he, he, I was going into a uh, diner one morning, and he said, that you, you're the sheriff, right? I said, yeah. He goes, i got to tell you something. I was in your place, and I'm not proud of it, but I just want you to know you're doing the right things. He said, because when I was in there, I, I'm being honest with you. He said, I had some of my friends from my community were in there, and when I was getting ready to be released, I didn't know if I wanted to leave because I was, he, he was being very honest. This guy was very, it was accessible. He said, I didn't know if I wanted to leave because it was basically I, I hanging out, doing just basically nothing with my buddies, and I didn't have, and, and this was a guy who was a businessman, and he did continue on to be, be successful in his business, but the point is, and I've had people stop me. I, 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 had a guy I mean, jail, in my mind, ought not be a destination location. Correct, but it was. That's the truth. It was. And anybody who tells you it wasn't is not being honest with you, including the inmates. And the inmates will tell you if they're really being honest. Yeah, I would rather watch TV. Lift weights. But my point is, if, and I've said it to the inmates, said, how come I can't have, why can't we put, have pull-up bars in our cells? I said, I have no problem with that. Give me the money for it. Yeah. Well, that, no, I said, but let me ask you a question. Do you want your, if you have any kids, would you want any young kids from your neighborhood to go through what you're going through right now? No. Well, if I do that for you, then I'm channeling you away from, pro you still get to make a decision to go to programs or not. Being your cell right. on the board, or you, when you're out in rec playing bas basketball outside, you can do that. But short of that, there isn't gonna be anything, that, alternatives like there used to be. So you can sit in your cell and be bored if you want. But why would I fail you and why would I fail the people in your community by, by knowing that you would be more tempted to go over and avoid the program that's gonna help you leave here and never come back? Why would I do that? Because that's, my charge is to do everything I can to make sure the communities are safe and that you get on a, a better trajectory. And I know I can't do that if I continue with that kind of a, a program. So I'm not gonna do it. That's amazing. I had a distributor once in Turkey and he asked me, he said, um, why do Americans like crime so much? And I said, like crime? We don't like crime. We have prisons. We he goes, no, you don't. You have Holiday Inns. He says, I have a question. I read that prisoners went on strike. He says, now in Turkey, when we go on strike, we don't go to work. So if the prisoners go on strike, do they go home? And you know, I sat there and I, I couldn't answer him. Right. Because, you know, it. He goes, I read they get college degrees, they get all these things. Is that prison? Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, um, I'm, a I, I'm a big believer that where we really need to invest our money, and I've been doing this 22 years. I've been saying it almost since day one. Yeah, where the people that are already well on this trajectory, established dysfunctional behavior since they were maybe 15, 16, and now in their 20s, it's very hard to change human behavior, but for those who want to, you want to give them that opportunity to, to turn things around. But the truth of the matter is, if we're going to be honest about this and really stop filling the beds generation after generation in prisons, we need to invest in the front end. Get to these kids in third and fourth grade. Invest in them. Make them feel like, hey, listen, what happened today in school matters to me. How did it go? How'd you do on your test? Take the time out to let them know that their achievements matter. But what's happening is, and why you see the emergence of gangs, for example, is that they're looking for that. And, and yeah, if, I, if this group says, hey, come join our gang, and I'm not getting any sense of achievement or feeling that anybody cares in my community or at home, then I'm gonna, f I'll, I'll belong to something. But and they're gonna say to me, listen, go steal that car. Right. You can get into the gang. And when I steal that car, yeah, but it's not an am A. Am I getting into the gang or am I getting into a family that You're getting I'm looking into a family. for? That's exactly what it is. That's my point. That they're, they're going to get what they didn't get in their family. One gang member said once, uh, several years ago from our place, you know, I know one thing, being involved in a gang, that if ever I don't have a place to sleep, no. my, one of my gang members will take me in. And, and it's kind of a sad... But it, it's replacing, you know, when we were kids... Most of us, 
If you screwed up in school, do what you want. Beat me. Do anything. Don't but tell my parents. Don't call my father. Right. I mean, God rest his soul, my dad never put a hand to me. But I don't know that I wasn't scared to death that if I embarrassed the family, right. what he would have done. Right. And, and, and that therein lies our point. We, I mean, if we, we have to understand the family is, no matter what, it is, it is the microcosm of our society. If it isn't intact, if people aren't having their emotions nurtured. You know, I, I, I remember talking to some elected officials in Rehoboth, the town of Rehoboth, small, good New England little town. I said, why don't you guys create a proclamation for your town that everybody in the town will have dinner with their family one night a week, whatever night you pick, but just one night a week. Do it, create the proclamation, get the town on board, people to go along with it, and then send it to the national news. And let them put it out there that Rehoboth's doing this. And suddenly some community in Iowa says, hey, that's a good idea. Well, why don't we do this or do that? You can move an entire nation. The most significant things that have happened that have moved this nation forward started with one or a small group yeah. of people. And, and that's why I'm saying we know what the answer is. All of us do. We know that we have to invest in these kids early on. That is our charge now. And what will be said of us in our generation? knowing that that's what we need to do by our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids that, hey, my mom, my dad, my grandfather and my great grandfather, um, when they knew things weren't going well, they stood down and they, they didn't do anything. They, didn't, they were too busy. It didn't matter. Yeah. And, and is that the legacy that we want? Is that what we want our kids? Because we do know what it is. We need to go back to the basics, invest, let them know what matters. Let them know that they matter and that what they're doing matters. And when you come home, how'd you do on that test? How'd school go today? Know that, they, that there's a place you where You know, and it's it funny matters. because you never know if your kids really value you being there. But I remember one time when my youngest daughter looked at me and says, you know, I was traumatized as a child. I said, you were? She goes, yes, I remember the field trip and the dance you missed. And I laughed. I said, you know, in how many years I missed one field trip and one dance? She goes, yes, and it scarred me for life. But, but you mattered. All joking aside, she remembered. Yes, she did. You know, and, and I remember the one time my father traveled all over the world. And I come from a family of 13 children. Oh, wow. So even if he didn't, it'd be hard to get to everybody's basketball <laughs> games and everything else. But my father, in my whole, I played basketball all through school. And my father made one game. One, only one game, but I was as proud and I remembered yeah. it like it was yesterday. And, and, and to this day, I can see exactly where he was sitting in the bleachers because it mattered to me. It mattered that much. And so when you think about the number of kids that are out there today that don't get any of that, what, where would we expect it? What well, direction would they My father came from come? Portugal. And I'll, to this day, say he was the most educated, non-educated person I've ever met because he taught me fundamental values. And it was funny because he didn't speak English very well. Um, I came from one of those houses that we didn't know there was another language. He's in Milford, he could get away from Portuguese, he never had to speak English. Yep. And we'd be at school at an event and somebody would tell my father, you have to go down to this chorus concert or this or game or to support your son. He had no clue, he put his little hat, his coat, and he'd be sitting there. And God dang, I would see him every time. And, you know, yeah. I'm so proud yeah. that even though he has no idea what's going on, he was told, if you want to support your son, show up. Right. And he did. And, you know, I mean, just to hear you say that and the way you say it, you, you can see, you can almost feel how, you, how it meant, how it felt to you and how important it was. And if we know that that matters, then why won't it matter for us to do that for our, our kids and our grandkids? Sure. And we know that there are a lot of kids out there that don't have, they're coming from broken places. We, okay, so we all step in. We step in. Because, because in the end, um, you know, these kids, but for the people stepping in, they're going to go wherever they think somebody cares. And it... And Generally, it's going to be the people family. that are drawing them in that are not going to give them the best advice. Yeah. And that's why, look, it's, it's our time in history for all of us at this point to, to look at our country 
it's a divided country right now um, where we can start having conversations again, listening to one another, respecting the fact that you came from a different perspective than me, and that's okay. We don't have to agree, but having the opportunity to, to talk to one another and know that we have differences of opinion gives us an opportunity not to be hateful or find a divide, but to say, is there something in there that can help me be now, better? Now, we hear a lot about immigration issues. Yeah. They have to be affecting your operation. Well, big time. Uh, look, um, I, I'm, I'm the son of an immigrant. I've had people accuse me of being a racist. Um, well, well, unless your name is Squanto or something, I think we're all well, daughters um, my father and sons. Well, my father came from England. He's, he's no, but I'm just saying, unless you're an course. American, a Native American. Native American, of course. We're, then we're, we're all to, son daughters of, of course, immigrants some, at some generation. Point, at some generation, yeah. My fa I'm, I'm, I'm a second generation person. So, so and I, I actually still I hold dual citizenship for, for England as well as the United States. But what I would, what I would tell you is that, that uh, when I hear people go, you're a racist because I, I support immigration law. Uh, I support the enforcement of the law. I've also been working on trying to reform immigration law since back in the days of Henry Hyde and Barney Frank in Washington on a bipartisan bill that I supported. Um, but, but immigration laws matter in this country. We have to, we've had them for generations and they're meant to control the, the population so that, for example, when our military were coming home in World War II, people were, were deported back to their countries or the, the numbers were, were stopped so that the president wanted at that time the veterans to be able to have for a first chance at the jobs, as they should. And so if you're going to immigrate from another country, it's a privilege. And what's really troubling to me is that we have elected officials who are saying, pay no attention to what's behind that curtain, all those people sneaking in over here. You people that are waiting behind your borders, you five million people around the world who are respecting the laws of this nation, you just keep doing that. Wait your turn, do your test, pay your fees, and don't worry about these other people sneaking in in front of you. Right? And that's what's going on. But Sheriff, isn't that the same thing? I don't understand this amnesty thing. Yeah. Y you're asking local law enforcement to use their judgment on which laws they can ignore. Right. You're asking them, it's worse than that. You're asking them to violate their oath. And there's okay. nothing worse than that. When I stand up and I take an oath to uphold the laws of this Commonwealth and the Constitution of the United States, as do everyone in law enforcement, judges, all of them, elected officials. How do you then say, it didn't really matter? Yeah. I'll pick and choose what laws I think. But see, if an officer sneezes, front page news, I'm proud of my little town, our little town, that we've had two demonstrations about our police officers and their performance. Both standing, once in the rain, but standing there saying, thank you. And that's wonderful. And I'm sure the officers feel, you know, even more part of the community and more appreciative that you do, you do that because they don't get that enough. And they and, and, and what a wonderful thing, you know, something this community should be very proud of. But and amnesty, I'm not supposed, as an officer, I'm not supposed to tell ICE or the federal officials that somebody broke the law. Yeah, under the sanctuary rules, the sanctuary policies that these people, if you ever notice, now, that, now they've changed it to we're a, um, we're a uh, friendly community, or I forget what the term is that they use. Um, it, it's all to hide the fact that they're, they're basically saying, we're going to allow people to come in here and violate the laws, and, uh, or welcoming communities, what they call it. They, now that's the term they use. So as though we're not, the, we're not welcoming. Look, you know, that's like saying, you know, we're a welcoming um, bank to bank robbers. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not comparing no, no, people that are illegally coming here as bank robbers and violent. I'm basically saying it, the idea that you would start to, to sort of um, mitigate something or change the meaning of it because you really are too embarrassed to admit that you know that there are laws on the books and you're trying to hide the fact that, that you're really violating those laws and encouraging people to violate these laws and you're going to create a special class of people that don't follow. But even worse, I invite you into my home. Right. And you start breaking my furniture. Shouldn't I have the right to say, get out? Right. So it's not even that you 
self-invited yourself into my house. You right. came into the country. You are technically illegal. You violated the And law. I can't use the politically correct phrase. It's dang illegal. But if I rob, uh, rape, do, commit a real crime, why can't I tell the feds, get him out of here, get her out of here? Well, I think when you start, when you start, here's where it starts to get to be a problem. And then it gets further into what you're talking about. And that is when you say to somebody in, in, every, in the town of Milford, you say, listen, new rule in town, no more locks on your doors. Anybody that wants to can come walk in. No, they don't, you didn't invite them, but they have a right to walk in. When you start doing that, now once you invite them to do that, once they're in your house, then they can start breaking your furniture. But then you have some people say, well, you know what? You can't kick them out of your house. They don't really have anywhere to go. So, and this is where this idea of even the people that are committing crimes, well, don't report them to the police, right? It's, it's what we've gotten to with this sanctuary policy. The best analogy I can give is it's, it undermines everything that we in law enforcement have done to marry our people in our community around keeping everything safe in our neighborhoods, in our, in our, our state, in our nation. Because with Neighborhood Watch, we always said, be our eyes and ears. Tell us what's going on. If you see something, you know if somebody is not see supposed See something, to be, say something. Some, if somebody's in, inside a building that's not supposed to be there, tell us. If, if, somebody's, if somebody's out on the street corner that you think's doing something wrong, tell us. That doesn't mean that person was. But at least you alerted us that they aren't usually there. We check them out. I'm going to watch. I check them out. Maybe I'm going to arrest them for, for something, or maybe they didn't belong there, but I'm not going to arrest them. That's kind of how it is with ICE. ICE isn't looking to arrest people who are just here illegally, even though they are illegal and they could be. They're, they're focusing on the criminals, the, the hundreds of thousands of criminals we have that are preying on, on the American people. So, so what they've done is these people who are encouraging sanctuaries are effectively saying, look, we're going to create this special class of people. You people who we told to watch and let us know what's going on in your neighborhoods, even if it's somebody here illegal that's a criminal, do not report it to ICE. If you law enforcement people pick somebody up and they're in your place, you know they're illegal, and you've arrested them on a crime, you are not allowed to notify ICE that you have them. But see, that's the operating word. You've arrested them yes. on a crime. I don't see our law enforcement officers doing sweeps no. in Milford of people who they are illegal because they're here, but are putting their heads down, trying to make a better life for their family, and following all the other laws. But if they commit a crime, sure. I have no sympathy. Sure, and, 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 and you know, why not do that for the American criminals? You had American criminals that commit crimes in your neighborhood, why not give them sanctuary? Well, see, that's Don't the other point that. that bothers me. If I'm an, uh, an American citizen, I have stricter laws. So if I move into Milford and I steal, I break into a place, I commit assault and battery. You're going to tell somebody, and if they find out that my name is really Joe Smith from my right. fingerprints, uh, they're going right. to take care of me. Right. But if I'm not an American citizen, I can't? Yeah. And, and, and so, so it goes back to this original point of, look, we asked the, the people of our communities to be our eyes and ears. We set up neighborhood watch programs. Now we have elected officials saying, listen, you law-abiding people that are working with the police officers that are trying to protect your community and concert with them, you need to go into the shadows and you need to be quiet. And you need to let the people who are hiding in the shadows, come who out. violated the law, come out and wander around your neighborhood with a protective bubble, and you need to leave them alone. Now, I, got, I think I heard this right, that in some parts of the country, if I find out somebody who's working for me has committed a crime if it's an American citizen, I can report them to the FBI or whatever. If it's an illegal alien, and I'm in a sanctuary area like San Francisco. Yeah, California. Yep. California. They, they passed a sanctuary, sanctuary law. So if I report that I've got Joe working for me, and, he's and I know he's illegal, and I know he's committed this crime, I can get prosecuted? Yeah. In other words, you're not allowed to report that you, have, you identify somebody that's illegal. Right. You don't know. He could be a terrorist. You don't know. And maybe he hasn't committed a crime. This is the part that's really troubling. We know terrorists are coming into the southern border. 
you, the 9-11 terrorists, there were 19 of them, they had 63 driver's licenses. 63. So, so here's the problem. You, 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 have, you have people that hadn't committed a crime yet. They were in the country. Some were illegal. Some were legal. They were on, on status. But they had 63 different driver's licenses, false identities. These people, if you ran across one of them, they were in flight school. If you notified ICE in a sanctuary city, you'd be getting in trouble. In California, if they were out of California, I'd be getting you'd prosecuted. Be getting in trouble. You would be getting prosecuted. Yep. For As following the U.S. Citizen. law. A law-abiding citizen reporting it because they created a state law that said you're not allowed to report it. But you know, the other thing, how is it that we're asking the enforcement end of our government? It's not executive. It's not legislative. So there's only one left right. to decide what laws, <clears throat> what federal laws they should listen to and which ones they should ignore each ignore them. How can you put an officer in that, you know, cross fire? Right. Well, well, that's the problem. And how can you put the American people in that situation where they're exposed to greater dangers when you know that there's a potential for this person? Look, in Puerto Rico right now, this is how bad it is. Now, you know they're trying to get driver's licenses in Massachusetts. Puerto Rico, I, I think there's 65 provinces, or I'm not sure the exact number, like states. If you live in Puerto Rico and you're a uh, Puerto Rican, you can go to every one of those 65 provinces up to three times a year and get three original copies of your birth certificate from each of those provinces. You're talking, what, 190 some original copies of your birth certificate. Now you say, why would you want that? Because I can sell them to the, to the Dominican cartels. And so I say to you, if you're a member of the cartel, hey, listen, here's, my, here's a birth certificate. It's original. You go to New York. But don't go, you go to any state, but don't go to New York and don't go to Massachusetts because I already sold the same one to two other people. And that's, that's what's happening. So now you come to Massachusetts and you have Juan, uh, Juan yeah, Joe Smith, whoever, his original birth certificate. Go to the Registry of Motor Vehicles, my original birth certificate. Okay, let's go. Yep, boom. Okay, here's your driver's license. You're a terrorist. You're a, you're a major member of the cartel. You're, a, you're one of the key people that's trying to get MS-13 up in the Northeast, which they now have been doing. I was just on the border not too long ago, and that's what the, the you know, the, the uh, chief moly. of the McGow um, McAllen sector was saying to me. I've been down there four times. And, uh, and this last time I was there, he said, you do know, Sheriff, that the word here in Mexico, right on the border here, MS-13, go to Massachusetts. That whole New England region, we want you to take it back over. You just saw the bus up in Lawrence, right? Big bus, MS-13. And they have been moving and migrating up. You can see it with the bus, with the moving up here. So, and keep this in mind. This is really important. We're 2,500 miles from the border. We have, we're the second most common place in the United States to find fentanyl. And between 2007 in 2017, 10 years, we've had the highest migration of illegal immigrants than any other state in the United States over that period of time. The highest. 2,500 miles from the border. That amazes me. Yep, 2,500 miles from the you border. You told me Texas, Arizona, Pew New Research Mexico. Research came out with a report less than six months ago. Wow. So you would have thought that, right? But it, what it proves is they migrate up to the areas where they know they get the best cover, right? That's where they want to go. And you can see it on a map. If you, we, there's a map that shows the, the, um, the trails of the, the routes of the drug cartels from the Mexican border up, and they all go through sanctuary cities, all the lines, well, for obvious reasons. If you're a criminal and you have a choice, you want to break into some houses, and you, you go down Main Street, in, in, or South Main Street here in Milford, are you going to pick the side of the street it's well lit and all the bushes are no. well groomed. Or are you going down the side of the street where the bushes are going <coughs> up over the windows and there's no light? What are you going to pick? Right? These, these people, that are, these cartels and people coming in, these gangs and all that, they know what, they, that's what they do. They look for the places where you're going to give them cover and let them lay low and do their operations. Same for the terrorists. They want time. Why would we do that to the American people? 
why would those of us who were given the privilege to serve in public office, who swore that we, first and foremost, provide safety and security for the people of our communities, it's the most fundamental uh, responsibility of government, why would we undermine that? And why would we provide the people who are looking to commit crimes how the benefit you, to do it more? How do you balance the political climate with your operations? Because you don't seem to be the most liberal leaning person in the most liberal leaning state. Well, I guess California beats us. Oh, yeah. We're the other bookend, though. The <laughs> no question say. about that. No question. But you know what? I never worried about that. I, I always believed, somebody, <coughs> when I was first running, a guy who, who was uh, the racing commissioner, uh, my wife had known uh, long before I met her when I came here. Um, she said, why don't we have lunch with him and find out? He's a Republican from this area and knows a lot of things, and he's worked with the governors up there. See what he thinks about your race. And he said to me, listen, my wife said, what do you think, Doc? What do you think about his, his first race here, you know, for sheriff? He goes, if he wants about this much of a chance of winning, He's got to at least change his party affiliation to independent. To unenrolled? To unenrolled. If he wants this much of a chance of winning, he's got to switch over to Democrat. But to be honest with you, I don't, I don't see it. And he definitely can't win as a Republican. And I said to him, I said, you know, Doc, I've heard a lot of great things about you, and I have a lot of respect for you. I haven't been here that long, but I've learned, heard a lot of good things about you. But if you're telling me I have to lie to people and pretend I'm somebody I'm not, they wouldn't like me when I got in yeah. anyway, and I wouldn't feel good about it. About getting in that way, um, I'm going to I'm going to run as a Republican, and I've been in for 22 years, and I, and I and I am because I believe when you take I don't care what your party affiliation is, we all have different points of view, we came from different backgrounds and different perspectives. But if you're going to take on a role of public trust, be honest with the people, yeah. just talk to them about what you believe is right for them, and if you don't, if you're way off base and you're out of whack. And that they shouldn't be there anyway. They won't elect you again. And, and, and you don't belong there because you're not, you're not serving them and you're not giving them what they want. And that's just, if you keep it that simple, forget the politics. Stop worrying about fighting. Uh, you're a Democrat. You're a Republican. You supported this one. You supported that one. Everybody does. Everybody supports who they believe is the right person. Well, it was an absolute pleasure. I enjoyed it. As yeah. we come down Thanks to the me. end. As always, hopefully you got a new perspective from Bristol County. It's not Milford. But some of the things that I'm hearing, I sure like, and I'll bring up with Uncle Lou to find out Sheriff Lou. why yeah. it's in Bristol and not Worcester. But as always... Well, he's doing a good job, too, out, out here. Oh, we, we like Uncle yeah, Lou. he's doing he's, a good job. He's helped us out. As always, thank you to our six loyal viewers. God bless, and may tomorrow be a better night than tonight. <laughs>